Welcome back to another episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilson. This is Virginia's podcast for the culture, from the culture. Back today with another exciting episode with Mayor LeVar Stoney, the Richmond City Mayor. However, before we get into this conversation, make sure you go follow this pod podcast, subscribe to this podcast wherever you like to consume podcasts. And uh, again, thank you guys for continuing to support the show. Mayor Stoney, uh, before we get into this, let me share with some, you some feedback. I got some great feedback recently from Richmond Magazine, actually. I am on page 94 of the February issue. And part of what motivated them to cover the podcast this month was our recent interview. And some of the feedback I got, they was really, uh, they, first off, the listeners clearly love you coming on the show. And they just felt like, um, which is part of what the motivation is for this show. They feel like, you know, it was a great way for them to see and hear the same message, but conveyed in a way that was easier to receive. And so we got great feedback. If I probably, I also need to uh, acknowledge HCA, the executives from HCA hospital, who've recently been on the show as well, because they also shared feedback about them and my good brother, Radio B. So like, but they was very complimentary of you and the show that we did uh, up at Stony Point Mall. And so thank you, because I may I may have not gotten that magazine without you, sir. So I appreciate you uh, continuing to show our listeners love. Uh, no, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we always love to have you, man, Stony, because uh, we get right down to business and you, you tell it how it is. And uh, we're having this episode for those of you <clears throat> who are listening, maybe from elsewhere outside of Richmond. Uh, Mayor Stoney just recently uh, delivered his State of the City speech, his seventh one, okay? And uh, I was at the event. I took some notes. It was a really good event, a really good time. Um, one thing I want to say about this, this event, I want to acknowledge the Richmond City Police Department because I'm not really big on going places where everybody's going to be at. I'm just, I've got in my older age, you know, here is, I'm, I've gotten nervous, quite frankly, and apprehensive. I mean, I'm still, I'm still not rested comfortably, you know, and I felt very safe at this event. I, uh, I was impressed from the beginning. I, I got there early. I got there about an hour early, set my car, read some notes, kind of wanted to see the landscape of how people was entering the building. Um, they had that place secured, you know, I mean, even to the extent that I almost thought somebody was going to hand me the toilet paper, I went to the bathroom. I was like, man, y'all guys, okay, y'all got it. Y'all got it. <laughs> y'all got it going on. So I want to take my hat off to the city of Richmond uh, for ensuring that uh, we were safe. And it was a great turnout. It was a great room of individuals. I was fortunate enough to be sitting right beside the president of VPM. Okay. So you, you need to know who I am. She said, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Said, that's good. Know. Actually, that's good. For that. That, who knows? You never know. You know, you never know. And you know what, Randy, that's what these mm -hmm. events really, they are about like, you know, receiving information about what's going on with the city, but also an opportunity for the doers and the dreamers within the city to rub shoulders and rub elbows with one another as well. And yeah. sometimes it takes events just like this. I think we had Randy, Close to 500 people showed up that evening uh, yeah. at the Science Museum of Virginia. So shout out to the Science Museum of Virginia. Shout out to the Richmond Police Department and all those involved uh, back at City Hall who made this uh, just a, the, the most perfect event um, one could have, have as, as their final state of the city address. Let me tell you what, if, if the city was well represented, the community was well represented, but somebody needed to take their hat off to the sisters of the church that was there because, Mayor, you got some very faithful members of the church community that was amen. And I was like, are we in the middle of church service or not? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know if you saw when I was up there giving, you know, I was like, you know, there are certain um, applause breaks that you just uh, assume are going to happen. Yeah. It's sort of written into the speech. This is an applause line. Yeah. But there were parts that were not supposed to be applause lines that they were actually applauding. Yes. And I was like, I don't know what, you know, I had somebody who was in the amen corner who were just like, you know, amen. Yes. So yes. I was like, oh, here we go. We, we in church now. So. But you had to love it. You had to love it because that was really 
genuinely the authentic crowd of Richmond that are your supporters that yeah, was there. This, this wasn't city council. This wasn't the school board. This was people of the community that truly have appreciated your seven years and your position as mayor of the city. And quite frankly, um, are sad to see this being the last one, you know? So um, I wanted to acknowledge that because uh, it felt like home in there for a minute. I, like I said, I didn't know if we was at Mount Zion, First Baptist, St. <laughs> Paul, but uh, may, you 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 may have a future hat, sir, uh, in ministry, it looks like. <laughs> so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, mayor Stoney, the youngest mayor in the history of, of Richmond City, you know, as, as a mayor of this office, and now you're closing in on your last year. And, and I've been very fortunate to have many of these conversations with you. And, and, and I've wanted to get to this point because we're going to talk about the past, the present, but the future, you know, and uh, you've been pretty tight lipped, you know, on, on how far ahead in the future you go. And you, even in your speech the other night, you said, you know, I still got another year, the job's still not done. And so I'm not trying to get too far ahead, mm -hmm. but if we can just start there, you know, let's, you did a great job at summarizing the seven years, but for those who may have not listened to the speech, how do you, how do you, how do you, how are you approaching this last year as mayor of the city uh, in your, in your final, your final year here? It's like mic drop time. It's like, it's, like it's, it's Kobe Bryant time for you right now. That's right. You know? That's right. And for me, this is an opportunity also to, you know, to, to sort of like lift up the work of those who, this is not a one man show. And even though, uh, folks who may have a problem with me, you know, who who don't know me very well. I, if, if they knew me, they knew that I'm, a, I'm big on team. I'm big on ensuring that the folks who do, do the work each and every day inside City Hall, the of the 3,500 or so employees, they get to sort of respect uh, that they deserve because this could not have been done without them. And so for me, this is going to be a year of completion, right? Like, you know, we're going to try and complete the projects uh, that we can, uh, and also leave the city in, in, in a good condition for the next mayor to sort of take the, the baton and begin to, to run that next race. And for me, I look back at the last seven years and the, the last decade in the city, and I think you've seen uh, just a time of progress, despite there being a global pandemic as well. When I look at the numbers, well, you know, we've cut poverty by 22% over the last seven years, uh, the last over the last decade, the the tax base has grown, has essentially doubled, went from 19 billion to 38 billion uh, dollars. Uh, the number of jobs that have come to the city of Richmond over the this period of time, 6,500 new jobs, you know, 3.8 billion dollars in announced capital investments from these economic development projects. Those who are choosing Richmond, population increase, the economy is, is doing. Uh, better than than the uh, than the than than the than the country as well. We're ahead of all our great ahead of all the numbers. I, I just feel fortunate that uh, I get to be here in my eighth year, and we get to talk about uh, progress and how the city's advanced versus the city going in the other direction. So uh, a lot of great things to highlight, and you know, one of the major ones that I like to highlight is the fact that when you double your tax base, it allows you to make serious investments in long-standing challenging problems. And the doubling tax base has allowed us to invest in public schools. We've been able to nearly increase our investment by nearly 50%. I'm very proud of that. You know, provide more after school programs, elementary school, middle school, start a new scholarship, uh, essentially a promise scholarship, uh, free community college program we call the Richmond Pathways Program. Um, 500 new child care slots because of our work as well. Uh, our roads are now considered, 70% of our roads are considered good versus the 70% that were considered bad by when I arrived in office. My goal is to make it 80% of our roads to be in good condition by leave the time I leave office. The historic investments we made in affordable housing. You know, we have $100 million that we're going to invest in affordable housing over the course of the next five years, 50 from the city and 50 from, from LISC. And so, you know, we've made so many great strides and, you know, I'm looking forward to whomever the next mayor is going to be just to keep the work going. That's what people want. People don't want us to go look back at, you know, what we were doing back in the 1970s. They want to know what's going to happen in 
you know, the 2030s moving forward. That's what this has to be about. You have to work on the here and now, which you all know, we talk about the here and now very regularly here in Richmond. And sometimes we like to go way in the past to talk about that as well. But we got to talk about what the future looks like, right? And the ability, providing the ability for uh, all the doers and all the dreamers in the city to continue to choose Richmond as the place to live, work, play, and learn. I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to try to tap in on some of those numbers. There's a couple things, and I'm not going to get too far ahead. I'm not. I want to, but I'm not. Not at this point in the interview. But something you said about future mayors and future leadership. Um, is there an opportunity? I think that there are people in the city that are anxious. I mean, as much as people are optimistic and hopeful and looking forward to a future, there are going to be people in the city that are going to be anxious for change. They're going to be nervous about it. Is there any type of trends like... I'm not even going to get into who the potential next, I'm not going there yet. For whomever that is, is there a transition period allowed in your position? Or do they just have to pick it up by the, you know, you leave the file on the desk and they have to come in and take it over? Like, what is that like? I mean, here's that we have never really professionalized the transition process, sort of like what you do at the state level. Mm -hmm. I was the deputy transition director for the McAuliffe administration when the governor was a private citizen. I led his transition. I helped lead his transition into state government. Uh, normally, they put a line item in the budget uh, so you can have all the items at your disposal, office space, things of that nature. Richmond doesn't do that. Um, it's what you do on your own, you know, through your campaign or whatnot. So what I want to do is sort of uh, institute a professional transition from one administration to another. And so that's something that you will likely see in my upcoming budget, because I think it's very important. Yeah. It's very important that they have access to the directors as quickly as possible. It's, it's important that they know what I'm getting on a, uh, a weekly basis in terms of police reports, things of that nature, public safety reports. So we're going to try and initiate a professional transition uh, after the election. And uh, it's my hope that we can institutionalize that through putting it in the next fiscal year budget. I mean, is it me or does it almost seem like that it's crazy that that hasn't existed? I mean, in all aspects of business, I mean, you're the CEO of the city pretty much. Right. You're like, how, why, why would that not already be in place? Like, and I, and I, cause I don't want to assume the typical cliche answer that a lot of people's it's one administration, another administration, it's politics. Mm -hmm. I, I hate that though. Like that's not good business though. Like how, right. why is that? Why do you think that's never been established? You know what? I mean, you're right. Politics may have something to do with it. Me and my predecessor, uh, Dwight Jones, we, you know, we've always been uh, good friends. Um, he he helped me with my transition, um, but it wasn't, you know, this wasn't something that's, you know, part of the protocols, though. This wasn't part of policy, and I want to make this a part of policy uh, moving forward. Um, but, you know, you can say politics, you can say you know, is, is sort of been an afterthought as well. Um, I, I think it's very, very important because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, the next mayor, they're going to start on day one, not with the knowledge that I have today. You're going to start with the, all the ideas that you want to implement, what yeah. you want to see executed. But you you quickly will find out that there's a process to all of this. And yeah. things you thought could get done overnight may take a couple years to to work out. And that's just the story of government. I know folks think, they want urgent response times. They want you know things to happen overnight, but that's not the way this works. It's the job of being mayor is about bringing people along uh, on to your position. You know, sometimes you can you likely will be ahead of the community. You'll be ahead of some of your constituents, and it's about how you go about bringing them along. And I'll admit there have been times where you know it, it did not work out where we brought everyone along. But I think some of the things that we sort of said this is where the city should be going. I think when you look back at this from 10 to 20 years from now, people are going to be like, you know what? That was actually the proper direction to be heading in. Yeah. You know, maybe what was maybe too too far ahead for the time, but it was certainly forward looking. And um, I, I'm proud of that. When I look at everything that we've been able to do over the course of the last seven years, people want to sometimes just hang these last, uh, my entirety, my tenure as mayor on economic development projects and they forget the fact that we have led you know economic you know business attraction business business development there's a reason why 
the economy is doing well here. And I believe local government has a role to play in terms of contributing to a stable functioning economy. Um, this isn't the Richmond of old, even though some people want it to be the Richmond of old in terms of the problems and the challenges that uh, any locality may have. But we are competitive because of some of the decisions we made in economic development and in our finances that you know allow us to be an investable place again. And so I think about the projects on the way, Randy, like the Diamond District, uh, City Center, um, the Shaco Heritage Campus, we'll have more to say about that this month in February. Uh, these are projects that are set to, will set the city up uh, to seize the future. We also, though, know that, you know, it can't stop with what we do. This is about value add. And whoever the next mayor is going to be, they have to add to the foundation that, you know, we provided. And they when, to after you serve your last day, are you, how easy, and, and obviously you got big plans ahead, but um, how difficult will it be for you to walk away from this seat and look back? You know, I mean, not so much look back, but maybe will it be challenging to walk away from the seat and see someone else come in it and have to assume those responsibilities with you possibly thinking about what you would do or what you, you know, what they should do? Well, you know, as a millennial, um, we're used to just moving from job to job, right? Not staying in one place long enough that grass actually grows under your feet. And most of my career has been like that, being able to move on after two or three years onto a new gig, something um, uh, something to advance your, your, your career. Uh, this has been my longest, uh, gig. You know, this has been the longest, uh, job I've ever had at, um, you know, it will be eight years and you can't look back on eight years without, you know, somewhat missing some of the, the work that you get to do, right. You know, I get to come to city hall every day and, and work on behalf of 230,000 people roughly. And, uh, it gets me out of bed each and every day. Some days are more challenging than the others, but I love the challenge, actually. That's what gets me going. You know, you don't grow without some challenges in life. And I, I, I've been able to build up some tough skin over this period of time uh, because you can't take everything personally. Uh, you can just got to go out there and just work hard and, and do the best you can with what, you, what you're given. And so I, I, would be, I wouldn't be human if I didn't miss this afterwards, I think, you know, yeah. um, this has been my life for eight years, but in the meantime, I've been able to build a life for myself within the last eight years as well, by, by meeting a, a very special woman, uh, who I'm building a family with. And, uh, I think my transition from mayor to private citizen and hopefully to governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, will be easier because I will have a family that will have my back through yeah. all of it yeah you made the comment in your speech that richmond was going to be your home i was i was a little surprised not that i mean not that i don't believe that you love richmond of course you love richmond i just think that i mean it's a lot of reasons particularly if you're upholding the governor's mansion then it's going to obviously be your home but like i want to deep dive into that a little bit more though yeah. like you're obviously you know the jersey was hung up. You become a family man. You got the dog and the cats. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's real now. Like you you're getting ready to bring on a little girl. If I'm correct, right? Right. Yeah. You're gonna have you're gonna be a mess. Like she can have you right around the finger. <laughs> but um, like I guess I want to ask that question again. Like yeah. for certain, know that about it. Richmond is home because there's so much potential for what could happen with you and your career, whether you're governor or not. If you're not governor, we foresee you doing something in DC regardless. I mean, you just, you know, you're the president of the mayor's association. You've got national contacts, but you want Richmond to be your home. Are you, you sure of that? Well, I'm 100% positive uh, that I want Richmond to be my home. You know, it's been my wife's home for most of her life. Um, and it's been my adopted home for now 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, you know, I grew up in Hampton Roads, but I chose Richmond. Mm -hmm. Um, I chose Richmond to start my career in and to, to start my family in as well. And I'm not going to have a problem raising my family here either. And I think, you know, we've become such an attractive place to live that, um, people from all over now want to come over here, start their careers. They want to start their families here. And I want them to raise their families here. And I think, uh, 
you know, we, barring anything that, you know, I don't know what may happen in the future, obviously. Um, I, I know I have an idea what I want to happen in the future, uh, part of my, my political career. Um, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. But, <laughs> but barring what, you know, the unforeseen, I, I, this is going to be my home for a very, very long time. We're always going to have a, a, a presence here. This is this is where Brandy's, you know, family, you know, her, her father grew up in Churchill. And you now today we'll start our family in Churchill. And so it, it, to us, it, that's special. You know, that that's very special. And, you know, for any, every time I travel the country, there's always someone who says they have roots in Richmond. I don't care if I'm in Detroit or if I'm in, you know, Los Angeles or in New York, there's someone who knows someone who has roots in Richmond. And I'm proud of the city that the city has become as well. I mean, this city has come a long way. It, we have certainly exercised and demonstrated resilience through all of it, uh, whether you talk about how we dealt with coming back from the white flight and the, the you know the flight that occurred, not just white flight, black flight as well. Brandy's family is from Churchill and we get to start our family in Churchill. I think that's I think that's pretty cool, you know, and it, it gets to connect. It's almost like we're coming full circle for her. And so uh like I said, you know, I can't predict the future. Um I'm gonna leave it to 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 the man upstairs uh, and he will guide my steps moving forward. I know what is ahead of me. That's being a father to this little girl, being a candidate for 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 governor, and also making sure I finish this last year up very strong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I think I think that I think you had a, I think you had a lot of supporters in the crowd that were happy to hear that. I think there's a lot of people who are supporting you, obviously, for governor, and so they they want that to be the only option, quite frankly. But I think there's also people that was probably surprised a little bit too I you know I, I think it was bold it was bold it pretty much said hey because you you know similar to you I'm not originally from here and so I think in the beginning of your uh your you know time as mayor you had to overcome some of that you know he's not you, from here you're not from here now now you are not only saying that you know I want to be your mayor and, and uphold this role for the city. But now you're saying, no, I chose, you, you chose, you used to, you use the word chose. I choose to be here. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to establish my home and family. So um, I thought that was great for those listening for That's sure. Right. You know, here's the thing. If you didn't know, I love this city already by the work I put in. Um, you, sh you should know by now that, you know, this is the place I want to raise my family. This is the place where my little girl will be born. So this will always to me, always be home. Yeah. Always. Just think thinking back to that night, man, that was a power. The lady who sang the national anthem had a powerful voice. It was oh, amazing. Cora Armstrong. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I want to shout her out. What was her name? A Cora Armstrong. Yeah. Powerful yeah. voice, right? Yeah. She set was. the tone for the night, I thought. She she set the tone. She did. She made, I mean, she she made it, you know, she set the tone. I was gonna say, and then and then Brandy did also, you know, oh. she did too. I think that. Thankfully, everyone followed in suit of that. You know, they made it a pretty difficult job for you, sir, to get up there and come behind all of that. But you did yes, a good job. Did. Yes, she did. And here's the thing. I had not seen uh, Brandy's remarks. Um, she wrote them on her own. She delivered them for the, you know, I had never read them or never heard the remarks. And so when I stepped out, uh, I, I told him I want to step out and hear my wife speak. And to be eight months pregnant up there, uh, and to deliver that, you know, and, and she, you know, I told her, I said, you got a future in, in politics, baby. And she was like, only for you, only for you. But I thought she was amazing. And the fact that a lot of her comments sort of matched what my theme was, telling the story of Richmond and how we have added our own chapters to that story uh, shows you that we're, we're very much in sync. Yeah. Brandy did a really good job. And, uh, I don't know if she thought eight years ago that she'd be the first lady of the city or not, you know, but it's interesting that she's really seeming to gracefully be that partner that, you know, that, that you would foresee and need, you know, Michelle and Barack over here, you know what I'm saying? But she really does. And uh, she did, a, she did a really good job. It was the first time I heard her speak, you know, publicly 
to that extent as well. And uh, it seemed like it came quite natural. It was natural. She's very, you know, she's compelling as well. Uh, outside of being beautiful, she's also highly, highly intelligent. I'm always, I'm the second smartest person in my household. I, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I like to hear you emphasize that because, and I'm intentional in saying this. Sometimes I think, um, sometimes I think as people, particularly black people, and we're in Black History Month, so I would be remiss if I don't acknowledge that. But yeah. you know, you hear so much sometimes about how passionate someone is or how beautiful someone is, and I'll tell people sometimes like, "Hey, we're intelligent too," That's you right. know. And it's like you you don't you never want that to be disguised for the things that people only see publicly you know um she did a good job of that she's definitely you know she's definitely uh doing our part and making you continue to look great you know um and i say that because as mayor i mean you've got you you have you've went through these past seven years um clean man I mean, that, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Clean. Like, you know, I think that, yes, you've dealt with all the things that mayors deal with, but as a black man, sometimes there's other things that come with just with the, the, the day and of day and of life. And it's like, there's no craziness out there. You know what I'm saying? In regard to stony this or stony that. And uh, I think you guys both edify each other very well. So um, while, while we're there, it is Black History Month. And um, can you talk a little bit about how, you on behalf of the city or moving and navigating throughout the city and the schools to just uh, add add more flair to what this this history this month is really all about and the history of our culture. Yeah, well, you know, um, we have contributed so much to the, not just the history of Richmond, um, Black people uh, have contributed so much uh, to the history of Richmond, but also the United States of America. When you think about the heroes and the giants that we stand on the shoulders of, uh, whether it's Magdalena Walker or uh, Oliver Hill or Spotswood Robinson, you think about all these greats, Doug Wilder, these folks not only contribute to Richmond's history, but also just overall American history. And so I don't know why we have to say this, but I think it's good that we do. And that is black history is American history. Yep. And if you do not tell the Black story, you are not telling the full story. And for some people, that's very, very hard for them to say, yeah. uh, for, hard for them to acknowledge. Um, but I think our acts and our deeds um, make them acknowledge, acknowledge it. Right yeah. now, this country would not be, the city wouldn't be what it is without our contributions. This country would not be what it is without our contributions. And so um, I'm a believer that young Black boys and girls uh, should be taught that they can be in any room. Because as you know, our ancestors, many died to ensure that we can yeah. be in any room. And I take that very seriously. And so with my little girl coming up, I'm going to raise her with uh, the, the belief that she can go walk into any room, no matter what the demographic is in the room. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's how I was raised. And um, I think more and more of our kids need to hear that. They don't need to hear just 29 days during Black History Month. They need to hear that 365 days a year. Yeah. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> we could say amen to that. And I'm doing that also for the sisters over at St. Paul, because I know they right now, they they sitting on the screen watching this like, that's my man. <laughs> that's my man. Um, all right. So I want to crunch. I want to get into these numbers a little bit. And then I want to uh, kind of talk a little bit about the future also. Mm -hmm. But with the reduced poverty being down 22 percent and violent crime being down 22 percent. Interesting. Coincidental? Parallel? Like, what's your thoughts there? I mean, that's to me is like. Just, it's right in your face. The number is what it is. I found that interesting. And, you know, we made some some progress on reducing the poverty rate. You know, when I started off as a candidate, I talked about the deconcentration of poverty in the city. And here's, just, mm -hmm. here's the thing. Because of uh, past uh, policies like redlining, um, poverty uh, and where people live uh, have uh, essentially they have, they've coincided with one another, right? And what we've been trying to do is obviously put an emphasis on building more housing in the city, building more affordable housing, so sort of uh, provide 
more opportunities for more, for more places for people to live, but also more opportunities to put food on the table and keep a roof over your family's heads uh, as well. And so uh, it shows that we have made some strides in our anti-poverty work and our economic empowerment work, but we still got a ways to go. I still think 19% is way too high. Uh, with a city that is as prosperous as us, it's very obvious that that prosperity has not spread to each and every household. And we have to continue to work towards that. Um, can, can I say something about violent crime as well? Yeah, I just, I mean, the the, the fact that the, I mean, the fact- Violent that crime is now 22%. And here's the thing. I know there's some folks who are always going to say, uh, well, those numbers don't mean anything because I don't feel safe. And I think that's what this is all about. Yes, the number of criminal incidents in the city is down. Those violent incidents are down. However, it's all about how you feel, right? Do you feel safe? walking around at night? Do you feel, and some people don't. And so our job isn't done. You know, we're, we're not going to pat ourselves on the back because crime has gone down over my 10 years mayor. We know that we got to continue to make sure this is a city that people should continue to choose to live in in the future. And that means we have to continue to invest in public safety. My tenure has been focused on, uh, you know, being tough on crime, but also being tough on the root causes of crime. So not only have we invested in the police department, right? Um, we've also invested in uh, creating that safety net for our families as well. So people don't fall through the cracks. And so emphasis on uh, how our nonprofit and grassroots organizations help us out, starting programs like We Matter RVA, starting at a young level, a uh, young age, uh, focus on those wraparound services goes a very long way. And so we got to just continue, we have to just continue pushing this. This can't end with the Stony administration. It has to continue with administration X, Y, or Z. And that's my hope it will. And when we do that, you're going to see poverty rate go down even further. And also you're going to see uh, violent crime continue to go down. I had a question about We Matter RVA. Um, I, I saw the kids there that had yeah. the sweatshirts on. I wasn't familiar with that. So I kind of, and there was a lot of people before the event that was talking about We Matter RVA. Yep. I felt lost. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so We Matter RVA started when we received a grant from um, um, uh, from from a state uh, from 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 the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we utilized this grant to sort of uh, focus on kids who were in middle school, who come from families that uh, may have encountered some gun violence. They had a brother or a, a dad who may have been involved in gun violence, and what we know from the studies is that. Uh, from research shows that if you are kin to someone who's been involved in gun violence, there's a high likelihood or a high probability that you may also be involved in gun violence in the future. So that's why we start at an early age with an after-school program we call We Matter RVA, which focuses on those kids and those families and shows our kids that there are other ways to, to resolve conflicts. Um, it's been um, and we also, by the way, we also pay the kids to be a part of the program as well. And so when the kids say, wait, I get, I get some sort of uh, a stipend to be a part of this project. Oh, I'm doing this. And so we, I've met so many young kids who I know have set themselves up for an even broader future because of this program. This is one of the many programs that we've been funding over the course of the last couple of years to sort of start throwing the entire kitchen sink at the gun violence issue in our city. Well, I mean, that's pretty, that's a, they're, they're being incentive to just by participating, they're getting paid. Stoney, we spoiling the kids, we paying them. <laughs> but it's good though. I mean, you know, it teaches them. It does. It's uh, sometimes you got to dangle the carrot. You really do. And so that's, that's right. And, 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 and can I, you know, the anti-poverty measures that we've undertaken, you know, number one, I, I talked about the guaranteed income program that we have, our, our pilot program called um, the Richard Resilience Initiative, where yes. we we send five hundred dollars to uh, over a hundred families uh, thus far, received a five hundred dollar uh, check each and every month, which they're spending it on child care, uh, essential household items. Uh, they're using it at Walmart and Target and the grocery stores. You know, it just gives people room to breathe because you know some of us may not think five hundred dollars is a lot. But when you are scraping by each and every month, um, living paycheck to paycheck, and you're about to go over that fiscal cliff, which my family's experienced in the past, 
$500 goes a long way to adding a little bit of security to when you put your head down on your pillow at night. So that's a, another special program. I talked about the Pathways program as well, which, you know, we are in all the high schools, all five of the high schools today. And if you want to go off to Reynolds Community College, we got you, right? We're going to maximize your financial aid, working with uh, a nonprofit called GRASP. They maximize everything you can get in financial aid. And then we come in afterwards and give you a scholarship to fill out the rest to ensure you can go to community college. And then we provide uh, a, a guaranteed uh, income or stipend. So when those situations occur, uh, occur like uh, my transmission is slipping or I got a flat tire or you know something happened at home that I can't, that I can't come to school, we want to eliminate the excuses. Because the number one thing when people say we'll go to community college, why they don't complete? Because life started happening. And as you know, a lot of my kids who go to rich and public schools, a lot of them are on free and reduced lunch. A lot of them are living uh, around the poverty line or below the poverty line. Anything could potentially happen. When it happens to kids who are growing up with the struggles of poverty, uh, the first thing they do is say, I can't do this anymore. I got to focus on home. We want them to have access to a post-secondary career that allows them actually to rise into the middle class and not just rise into the middle class, but stay in the middle class. Yeah. You know, as we talk about finances, I was blown away in the presentation when you shared that you was balancing the family's checkbook at eight years old. Like, come on, Stoney. I was sitting there thinking like, come on, man, this is. And, and, and that's a, that's a true story right there. You know, my grandmother who did not have no more than a sixth grade she didn't have uh, a she she didn't have a high school education. She had a sixth grade education, and so when we moved into this new apartment uh, in York County, uh, my uncle and my dad said, "You're going to have to be responsible for making sure the bills are going to be paid every month." And so I would go to the mailbox, get the Dominion Power bill, get the Virginia Gas bill, get the uh, and make sure I knew what the number to write out for the rent. And every year, my every every month, my grandma would sit me down at the kitchen table and she would open up the the envelopes and say, you know, I would fill out the check, I'll push the checkbook over to her. She would sign her name, I'd tear it out, put it all together and send it out. And then keep, keep track about how much money we had left to spend on groceries and anything else. And so when you're eight, nine, 10 years old, having to call the bank, at the end of the uh, month and find out that you only have $30 left and it's seven days left in the week. That's a hard thing to go back and tell your parent, go back and tell my grandmother. But you know what? She always, she never, you know, I'm sure she stressed about it, but she never made us uh, stress about it. And, you know, I would report back that we had $30 left and she said, we're going to be all right. We're going to make it work. And we always made it work. There's I don't want to I don't want to get off too far because I know we, we get, we're short on time, but I, I got to ask this question because I never have asked it. So it, it, what age did you lose your grandma? What what age did what? Did I lose my grandma? Yeah. How old were you? How old I were was, you? Um, I was 31. Okay. So she's seen you get to college and yep. um, she didn't, she saw me become, I became secretary of the Commonwealth while she was still alive, but she couldn't make it out. Uh, to my swearing in or anything of the sort because she was suffering from um, Alzheimer's, from dementia. And you, so you're different. You're different because a lot of us have come from, you know, we all are trying to be ahead of, you know, like we, our parents. You know, we're all we, we're working, but but you've been very candid about your your time coming up, and you know, things wasn't always easy, and. Um, I think that's one of the things that probably help compel children when they see you and listen to you is that you went to JMU. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're proud of that school. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a Virginia person in the end, but I'm sure you're proud of your school. You got to college. You did well for yourself, and uh, it had to be the foundation of how you was raised and how you how you was brought up because it wasn't like it wasn't given to you. That's right. You know, so I mean, I, I think that's I think that's part of the conviction that probably shows when you're talking to young people and they're listening to you, they can see themselves in you. And 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 I say that as an adult because I don't. There's not a lot of I don't know a lot of adults our age that have, you know, excelled to the level of success that you have either. Particularly coming from hard hard times. So 
uh, hopefully that only continues to contribute to your, your future success and your, and your professional plans. And, and I don't want to get too far off here because I still in these numbers, I want to get there. So I, I hate, I, sorry, I apologize. I digressed a little bit, but no, kind, of, kind of brought that out of me. I, it's interesting to see how you went from here to here to here, particularly when you come from managing the, 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 the finances at eight years old and, you know, that's, that's a lot, man. That's a lot. That's, 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 that's more than, you know, I've seen it bring you to tears almost at times, you know, and really yeah. when I, when I think about it, I'm like, it's, it's clearly more than words because it's been a part of your story the whole time you've been in office. Here's the thing, you know, Randy, when I practice my remarks, you know, those moments where I talk about my grandmother, my late grandmother or my late father, they normally don't choke me up. I'm just, you know, reading and rehearsing the speech. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm in that moment, which people, you know, my wife said, I can tell when you are in it, mm -hmm. like you are in the moment you are into the words you are in, you're, you're in it. And when I was up on the dais and on the stage and gave those remarks, I will, uh, it was, I was almost overcome by the fact that, you know, talking about the relationship that me and my grandmother had, you know, yeah. I don't have a, let's just say this. I wished I had a, I wish I had a better relationship with my, my birth mother. Yeah. Um, and every day, you know what, we're imperfect. I'm always trying to get better. I think she's always trying to get better as well. I'm always trying to, you know, I could probably do a better job. She could probably do a better job of making that relationship work, but at least we have ability to text one another and, you know, recognize each other, you know, uh, down again. But my grandmother was the person who actually served as my mother. And when I gave that story about how she would sneak $5 to me, you yeah. know, she would ball it up, you know, and sneak it, you know, sneak it to me. Um, that, that, that almost had me, you know, I was almost broke, breaking down in the middle of the speech because that's a real story. And that's, um, she taught me so much. And I think, um, I think she'd be very proud. I think she'd be very proud. You know, um, I'm sure she would be. Um, I tend to think the same about my grandmother. I lost her at 17. Uh, well, 18, one of them. And I recently lost my, my father's mother, uh, just three, four months ago. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Um, okay. Let me get back focus here. A couple years ago, I know, I don't know at what part of your camp, I don't know what, at what part of your tenure that you, you initiated this. I don't, I don't think it was in the beginning, but I may be wrong, but I know that there, at one point there was a goal for you to have 10,000 new affordable homes. I think we're at 4,000. We're at 4,000. Yeah. We've spent roughly, forget $43 million, I believe in the last few years on affordable housing projects. How uh, probable is it to get that goal of 10 in one year? That's kind of where I'm at. Like, I, I, I think uh, 10, uh, I, I think it's very, um, uh, no, 10,000 in the decade. That was where uh, it's been our goal. Okay. Right. Um, because there's a thing, we are roughly what 30 to 40,000 units short in the region when it comes to affordable housing, uh, how many we need. Mm -hmm. We think that we can bring to four 10,000 uh, from the city. Um, I think we're well on our way of accomplishing that goal. We got a hundred million dollars coming over the course of the next five years. So the city is going to put in 50. We got Lisk out of New New York to put in 50 as well. That is going to take us, we're going to be able to do a whole lot of affordable housing with those uh with those those type of numbers and that type of funding. But here's the thing, the honest truth is we need more housing in general. Yeah. Right? We just not only need affordable housing so that nurses and custodians and teachers can all live in the city of limit city limits. We also need uh more housing in general so our professional class can live uh, in the city. Uh, and also if they wanna buy a home, they can also purchase a home as well. A lot of millennials who were a little late to the game in purchasing homes are finding it very difficult to buy a home in the city of Richmond right now because yeah. there just aren't any any homes listed yeah. really anymore. And so that shows you the, 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 the crisis that we're in that you, know, you can't even find, when we're attracting professors to come work at VCU or U of R, they're having a hard time with finding a, a home listed in the city. And so not only do you have a rental, uh, affordable rental crisis, you also have a home buying crisis as well, where you can't even find a home in the city. And so we need more homes, period. And that's why we have leaned into density. We've leaned into 
uh, uh, reforming our zoning code as well, changing uh, things like, you know, parking minimums and allowing for ADUs, accessory dwelling units uh, on, on parcels now across the city. These will bring more units to bear, I think, moving forward, make developers make investments. Because at the end of the day, this just comes down to whether or not a person is going to be willing to make an investment into multifamily or building new homes in the city. We're going to do our part and we're hopefully this will uh, challenge the private sector to do their part as well. Okay. I, I want to, let me take a quick temperature check of time. I got, I got, we got 10 minutes. If we could, we squeeze 15. We can do 15. Yeah. Okay. I want I want to make sure we're efficient with time here. Um, explain to me what an MEI score, like it went from 40 to hundred, 42 to hundred. Explain to us what that means. Yeah. Th this is in our, our cultural, um, in our cultural work category. And the MEI is the Municipal Equality Index. So the Human Rights Campaign, um, an organization focused on um, the LGBTQ rights, uh, which I think are human rights. Um, uh, the Human Rights Campaign has been focused on seeing where cities are, or assessing where cities are in terms of being a more welcoming and more inclusive place for the LGBT community. And when I started out as mayor, I was informed by one of the staffers over at HRC that Richmond came in at a 42 out of 100. And so over the course of a period of time, these last uh, seven years, I said, no, we, we, I, I am, 42 is unacceptable. Yeah. Right. And 20, whatever it was, you know, in the tw late 20 teens or the early 20, you know, 2020s, being in the 40s is unacceptable. So over the course of the last, I believe, four years in a row, that we've had a 100% a perfect score in the MEI, uh, the Municipal Inequality Index. We were the first locality in Virginia to have a perfect score. And it's all about how welcoming we are to the LGBT community. And uh, I'm glad that there are some cities in Virginia who have followed our lead. And we can't let, you know, keep our, we have to keep our foot on the, on the gas on this as well. It has to be more than just about raising the flag at the, the progress flag at City Hall it has to be about our actions as well. And we've been able to demonstrate whether it's us pursuing uh, um, better health benefit policies for uh, the transgender community inside uh, City Hall to having a LGBT liaison working with the community, not just with the police department working out of our office as well. We've proven that we can be a more welcoming and inclusive place. And guess what? Young people, Gen Zers and millennials and beyond want to be in a place that is more welcoming and more inclusive. It's good for your economic, uh, uh, it's good for the economy, uh, and it's just good for attracting the smartest, most brightest people to your city. And so we're making serious strides, and uh, I think the entire region hopefully will be following our lead moving forward. Yeah, you made some comments actually uh, during the speech. I mean, there's a about a lot of more, a lot more, a lot, a lot of people want to work in the city now. I mean, you've made the city. You've made it a more attractive place to work. Minimum wage has been raised to eighteen dollars an hour. Uh, uh, it looks four to eight weeks paternal leave. Yeah, uh, we, we increased uh, the parental leave to eight weeks, which is the most by any municipality uh, in the state. We're proud of that. We just initiated collective bargaining for yeah. employees as well for the southernmost yeah, the crowd. Look, the crowd got really hyped there. Yeah. And right, like you know, the, the most the southernmost locality in Virginia was collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. So we believe that labor uh, can be uh, great partners for our workers, and so we plan on working with them for years and years to come. Um, the, the pay increases and the salary increases, you know. Yeah, teachers up fifty up to sixty four thousand dollars. That threw me off. Also, I was like fifty two to sixty four thousand dollar increase. That's right. That's right. Me median salary. Medium salary. Yeah, that's the median salary for teachers here in the, in the city of Richmond. Like I said, when we started out, fifty-two thousand. Now sixty-four thousand. When you almost increase funding for RPS by almost fifty percent, it allows them to do that and invest in the human capital of uh, the school system, and that's that's our teachers. And so, not only have teachers seen their pay increase over time, police officers have, firefighters have, general non-sworn employees at the city of Richmond have as well. So I'm proud of that. You know, I, I tell a story. Randy, that when I was uh, in my early years, I think we started giving just small bonuses to our our uh, employees 
to sort of like, you know, reward them for a year of a job well done. And I remember uh, one of uh, my employees over at the Department of Public Works recited my story back to me about being born uh, to a couple of teenagers, knowing that my dad was a custodian at a high school. And he said, you think it would be acceptable to provide these sort of, you know, small bonuses, 1% increase in salary to your father? And I said, you know what, you got a point. And ever since that time forward, I've been focused on investing in our employees, even despite a pandemic being disruptive, we've been investing in our employees each and every year for the last three or four years. Is that employee still there? That employee, I, I think he may have actually retired, you know. Uh, you and, go and back we, and tell it, that would be pretty rewarding to know that they they kind of contributed to the thought, you know. Oh, yeah. Change. Oh, yeah. And here's the thing. I'm glad I always make myself available to our employees. I'm looking forward to doing more opportunities as I, yeah, this is my last year. I want to close out the way I want to close it out. So yeah. I'm going to be visiting some uh, of our sites across the city where our employees are and just thanking them for yeah. just being a part of this. You're on the farewell tour there, That's Kobe. Right. That's right. <laughs> Take the jersey with I you. I don't plan on going food. too far, but I'm on a farewell tour towards <laughs> the end of this year. Um, built three new schools uh, over the time, and it sounds like you have a solid plan in place for the continuation of that. I know that George With has been one of the schools that you've been really working to try to mm -hmm see some development there. What's the, what do you foresee in the near future as far as any school, uh, new school construction? Well, you know, we stuck our necks out back in 2018 and raised the mills tax by 1.5% that allowed us to finance the construction of three new schools in black and brown neighborhoods. I'm very, very proud of that. We now have um, uh, River City, uh, Henry Marsh and Cardinal, uh, elementary school. Um, very proud of those three new schools. But also, I knew that we had to continue to add more schools uh, to that. And that's why Richmond High School for the Arts, School of the Heart for the Arts, uh, will be built. That's the, the new George with, uh, with the $200 million that we've been able to allocate towards that project. And then we put $15 million into the replacement of uh, uh, Fox Elementary School as well that suffered a fire a couple of years ago. So those two are in the queue. Uh, setting the city up nicely to move some of these old decrepit buildings uh, uh, out of uh, operation and also welcome some more state-of-the-art facilities moving forward. And I'm also very excited if it gets through the General Assembly, the potential for us to use a 1% increase on the sales tax to maybe build more schools in the future as well. So, you know, some some things, some 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 options and opportunities are ahead of us uh, for the city. Good. All right, I'm going to yield here because of time. I could go on. I could go on in a couple of areas. I, we've, yeah. talked, <laughs> we've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, when you talk about some, uh, what was the number? It was, I think you said there's been about 6,500 new jobs, I think, yeah. and $3.8 billion in new capital investment. I would assume, you know, that's the, the Diamond District. Um, so, so those numbers right there, the 6,500 new jobs and the 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 capital investment that's doesn't ex, that doesn't include what the future diamond district in the city center okay so you're saying co-star i would imagine is a big part of that co-star is a big part of that because those are announced projects mm -hmm. flow carmax halion vpm all locating here in the city of richmond yeah. so these are all announced projects that are all in the works in the diamond district and city center in the Shaco Heritage Campus, yeah, those are our ways of solidifying the future, right? Okay, we are going to benefit and reap the benefits from those projects for for years and years to come for the probably the course the course of the next decade. So I'm very very proud of that. Um, uh, so it's a hip hop artist in the city of Richmond. His name is Trig. He has a new project called Author Ash Boulevard, and on the in the beginning of it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting like prelude or interlude into it. So it's like who. We still trying to figure out who Scott is. <laughs> <laughs> do you know Scott? Do you, do you know who uh, Scott Scott's is? Edition? Yeah, do you, but do you know Scott? I, I don't know Scott. There's who something Scott? historic around Scott. We need to know who the hell Scott is, okay? I'm sure uh, we'll find out after this. Somebody, <laughs> you got some very industrious, intelligent uh, consumers uh, who will definitely let hit you up and be like, I'll tell you who Scott is. But we would figure the mayor would know Scott. I don't, I don't know Scott. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's some sort of historic... Uh, there are some historic roots to it, 
but I don't know. I don't know Scott. I'm gonna need your advisors down there to make sure that you know Scott. So the next time you're in a school of a kid to ask you, hey, I was listening to this artist, this rapper's album about well, we trying to figure out who Scott is that Mayor Stoney could be to let him know. Well, you know, the one thing, Randy, that I think is, you know, uh happening everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. it, it used to be Tyson's corner. Now people just say Tyson's. Yeah. Scott's editions. A lot of people just saying Scott's now. We, I don't even know who Scott is, but we, we're gonna figure it out. We got to transition. <laughs> we got five minutes here. I don't. We we got to talk about the future. I mean, this is this is, you know, you you've you've managed me well in this in talking about this. But the, the cat's out of the bag now. I mean, you're running for governor, yeah. and obviously this is a big deal. This is a big time. It's your last year in office as the mayor. You're running for governor. So like, how are you juggling both of those balls right now? You know what? I got an excellent uh, scheduler, uh, Laura Harrison, who who works and uh, works on my calendar each and every day. Uh, I give her a gold medal, a gold star because she's the best. Uh, so I got to give her a shout out. Um, you know what? Like I said earlier, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Um, I've got a lot of energy at still at age 42. I might not be what I was when I was 35, but I still got a lot of energy to, to, to juggle a lot. Uh, as I said, come uh, early March, my number one priority will be meeting my little girl, being with my little girl. But uh, obviously, the, the 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 hat I wear as mayor will never come off uh, until eleven fifty nine, December thirty first. So I, I'm going to still be doing that. But on the side, I'm also going to be continue gearing up this campaign for for governor. And you know what? We launched this campaign back in December, and the reason I chose to run because I do believe that. Uh, a kid who came from a struggling, um, uh, a kid who struggled uh, when he was uh, when he was younger, I wouldn't be here without a strong family and strong access to uh, public education and but also uh, economic opportunities. But my fear is that the window, that door of opportunity, is closing on a lot of kids in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I want to make sure that every child and every family gets a fair shot out there. And to me, a fair shot is the ability to put food on the table and keep a roof over your family's heads. And so we want families to rise into that middle class. And I'm gonna take that message uh, to Northern Virginia, to Hampton Roads, to Southwest Virginia, to the Shenandoah Valley and throughout. And I believe I'm the only candidate uh, in this race who can go into every corner of the Commonwealth, but also be in any room um, because we have been forced to do that most of our lives. And um, I, I think I look back at my record as mayor, I've been, uh, Keep a, I've kept a hands-on approach that's gotten a lot done. We've talked a lot about that today. And it's simply been focused on economic mobility and giving folks a fair shot. So I think that is a story that will resonate in all parts of this state. I'm really, really excited about getting out there and visiting people, being in their living rooms, being at their kitchen tables, talking about the issues that matter to them. Okay, two questions kind of about we close. And I mean, at, in this pursuit uh, of governor, um, you're up against uh, Abigail Spanberg. I think she's the other main person in the primary. You're a very positive, optimistic, forward-focused person. Do you see what, you know, because she's had some history at, at, at this before, like she's raised a lot of money. Um, do you see any, what do you see? Any obstacles? Do you see any challenges? Do you, see, what, what, do you what do you see that could make it, challenging i mean is it, it I, i'm of the of the opinion that it's not going to be an easy road ahead obviously but what do you see that you know that you're what's the main thing or things that you feel like you're going to have to overcome you know randy I, I feel like i'm in a similar position i was when i started out uh, as a candidate for mayor of richmond a lot of people didn't know who i was uh they knew that there's this young guy who you know claims that he can do the job as mayor and I was discounted. I was overlooked. I remember people who were telling me that uh, I should sit this one out and uh, or they'll get me a job or something like that. You know, people offer to get me a job and, you know, my, my the future's bright. You just sit this one out, let someone else do the job. And I, I, I took no for an answer. And I'm taking no for an answer again because I know there are a lot of families, a lot of kids who uh, understand my background, understand my upbringing, but also understand the record that I have here as mayor. Uh, in terms of putting Richmond on the right track and now being the best place to live in the Commonwealth of Virginia. My uh, being discounted, being underestimated is the story of my life. Being the underdog 
has been the story of my life. It was the story when I started out as mayor. It was the story uh, when I started out as a kid. And it's the story now. So when people say, well, why would you put yourself through this? I said, this ain't a thing to me because I've always been the one being discounted. I've always been the one been, who's been counted out, uh, been underestimated. So it will be challenging. Um, but as I told you earlier, you don't grow without some challenge in life. And the, the reason why I'm, why I'm here today as the mayor, uh, the 80th mayor of Richmond, the youngest mayor in the city's history because of resilience and the ability to persevere. And so I'm up for the challenge. I'm looking forward to it because I know that we can do a lot of great things in the state, particularly when a lot of when, when kids and struggling families are given an opportunity. That will be my focus. And I can't wait to get out there and tell the world here in the Commonwealth about it. Great answer. I, I have nothing else to say on that part. <laughs> uh, that was good. That, that really was good. Uh, yeah, I mean, Brandy, continue to keep making those meals. <laughs> keep them fed she's, keep them rested she's not making much of any meals and she does she does still cook but you know i'm doing my best to make sure that she gets you know everything that she needs right now yeah, you can't fill her up with sodium with a microwave meal stony you got to make sure you <laughs> take care of it well okay well, last question last question seriously okay you never i've never got this i've never got this oh, out of you here we go it will you at any point endorse the next future mayor of Richmond? Would you endorse a candidate? There's a couple, look, I got a couple messages today. I got a couple interviews lined up actually. Who I, yeah, who I endorsing for? I got, a, I got a couple interviews set up right now for p potential future candidates of mayor. They already mm -hmm. want to talk about it. Um, Michelle Mosby's name is in the, is in the hat there. I just got, I, I, I'm not familiar with, I think it's Frank Tucker. Uh, maybe Frank, no, Frank Tucker's not the name. It's uh, actually, uh, he's the person who's setting this up. Um, it's another gentleman on the south side of Richmond. I'll, I'll, the name will come here in a second. I'm, I'm going to drop the name because I'm sure they want me to drop it. But um, will you ever endorse anybody? You know, right now, I I'm just like, you know, like many city residents, I I'm observing and watching to see who will jump in the race. And then I want to see how they perform with the challenges of a campaign. Um, I want to hear about what they want to do um, with, you know, their vision and, and where this, what direction the city wants to, should be going in. You know, uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, this people forget that campaigns are not about tearing down the current administration or tearing down your opponent. Uh, these campaigns for mayor must and should be about the future where they want to take uh, the city of Richmond. Um, I know that campaigns will be critical. Uh, you know, I, I, I welcome constructive criticism. Uh, and I know that campaigns also involve a lot of promises as well. You have to be aspirational. But most importantly, what I found in my two campaigns for, for mayor is that people want to hear about where do you want to take our city over the course of the next eight years? Because you have to assume I'm going to win this time and I'm going to win the next time to continue the job. So where do you see the city of Richmond in a decade from now? That's what this conversation has to be about. It has to be about adding on to what we've already done, being a value add. And when I hear that and that message starts to, you know, this, this is how I'm going to find out who the person I'm going to vote for. Right. This is and I think a lot of folks are going through that process right now. We haven't heard a lot of names. We haven't heard a lot about what folks want to do. We'll give it some time. I always remind folks, I didn't jump in the race for mayor until April of 2016. And so we're still in February. Um, we got yeah. a lot of time before people can actually, you don't have to file the paperwork until June. Yeah. So I'm expecting, Randy, this is going to be another long journey. To we're, here for, to the next we're here for it. Week. We're here for it. <laughs> yeah. I, the name I mentioned is not the name. That's the guy that's making the connection. And I've, I've talked to... Uh, Alexis Rogers, I know she's not running. I've actually, I'm going to say this live and we're going to close. Oh, Alexis I'm, is not running. She never told me she wasn't running. So this, you just well, broke some news. <laughs> to, to my knowledge, well, to my knowledge, my people telling me that, you know, I don't know. We, we don't know. I don't, I don't think so, but I may be wrong. Something could change. I think she's happy doing what she's doing from what I've gathered. But, um, but I think, I think we'll have some strong candidates. I think Jeff Bourne should run. And, uh, 
the reason why I think he should run is because I'm looking for someone who has some type of experience to run. Like yeah. I'm, I don't want someone to run that's just feels like based off popularity. Like Jeff is, he worked with Dwight Jones. He's been a delegate, state delegate. He has, he has a background in governance. You know that something. I, otherwise, just names coming into the pilot. That's where I feel like the anxiety comes from. It's like, what have you done? You know, who who are you? You know, like that's right. And you're right, Jeff has served at the school board level. He served in the Jones administration. He served uh, in the General Assembly, in the House of Delegates. He served I, feel like, I feel like from a profile standpoint, he is as qualified, attorney. more qualified than anyone else that I've heard. So, But I talked to Jeff. You know, I'm out here doing my journalism. Jeff's watching his children grow and excited about that. And I don't know if his head's there, but I'm going to continue to poach him and figure out what we're going we're gonna to try to see here. He maybe, 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 maybe you can get in his ear. He would certainly make a great uh, a great mayor if he chose to go that route. And you know we won't cut that up as an endorsement, but it sounds like you're in favor of him considering considering it. I mean, he he should. He would be a good mayor if he chose to go that route. I went way over, mayor. All right, way man. Over. I appreciate you, Randy. I appreciate you. Thank you guys for checking out this episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. Remember, you can find this podcast everywhere podcasts are played. But I consider you go over here and see the gentleman on YouTube and we're out.